Eugene Peterson, the Presbyterian pastor who gave us the message version of the Bible and a couple dozen other books, spent his ministry in the church primarily in a Maryland suburb of Washington, D.C. But he grew up in Montana, and that's where he went before he retired, and he passed away just a few years ago. I remember him telling us once that when he was a boy, he was walking home from school. He was on a rural road, and there was a farm next to him with fields, and in that field was a big, burly neighbor that he knew, who was on a big, burly tractor. And from the distance, as he glanced over, the man was doing this to Petey. He was called Petey in that neighborhood because of Peterson. But he, Petey, didn't quite figure out what was going on, so he kept marching along. And then there was a shout, Petey, and he turned and he got the idea that he should hop the fence and go over to the tractor. And when he got there, his big burly neighbor said, why didn't you come over when I was waving at you? So I didn't know that that's what you meant. And he says, well, how do you tell somebody to come? And Petey pulled out his little six-year-old index finger and went like this. <laughs> And his neighbor said, ah, Petey, that's kid stuff. We're going to come today to Mark with his unique voice. And he's going to tell us that there is windmill big stuff in Jesus Christ that is so important to you and to me. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would be in this part of worship of sitting before your word, letting you read us and speak to us. And our prayer is that that would indeed happen in normal and supernormal ways. Please hear our prayer. It's made in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if, if he's going to bring something on that is big and windmill-like, it gets me thinking of what is big and windmill-like, and one of the things that's big and windmill-like are big windmill-like questions. And I don't know what kind of questions you think are the biggest questions of life, but I would say, is there a God? Is he knowable? How do you know him if he is? How do you beat death? How do you eradicate corruption amongst us and inside of us? What does it mean to be truly alive and good, and how does that happen? And when I say that Mark is bringing us to a windmill-sized Jesus Christ, it's because Jesus Christ addresses every one of those huge, significant, important for our lives questions. It is, I suggest to you, very important that we not only read what Mark says, but we note how he says it. A number of weeks ago, somebody was in the office, and as I approached them to give them a hug, they kind of stepped back and shared a sniffle and said, you know, I'm Scottish, and that means I'm really frugal, so I'm not going to share this with you. <laughs> well, when we look at how uh, Mark communicates, uh, he's not Scottish, but he is frugal, not that he doesn't want to share, but he shares in a very spare and brisk way and terse sort of way. He hits the ground running. Everything is kind of an executive summary. He's the one who says, and then, and then, and then. Or immediately, immediately, immediately. And there's always action. Every time there's action. He is brisk and full of action. His is not the sermons of Matthew. Matthew's got, for example, the Sermon on the Mount. Count them. Chapters 5, 6, and 7. Long chapters on teaching. His is not Luke. With all the stories of women and children and Gentiles and outsiders, he, he doesn't dilly-dally with those things. And his is not the evangelist John. With all his symbolism and literary 
artistry. No, Mark is just cut to the chase. Let's mince no words. Let's see what Jesus did. And that tells us something very significant. Despite probably the most common approach and understanding in the whole world to Christianity, namely that it is teaching, and teaching about how to be nice, what we learn from how Mark tells us is that it's not that at all. It is a happening. It is an action. It is a person in accomplishment. If we said, you know, D-Day, Normandy, you know the real value of that and what we hold on to it for is it teaches us military strategy. That's not it at all. It's not about learning military strategy. It's that a decisive battle and victory was won there at great cost. And the same thing is true when we come to the scriptures through Mark. He is telling us that this is not moral teaching. In Christianity, we have Jesus Christ, a great person who entered human history, but General Eisenhower was a great person. It isn't that he was merely great. He was great because of what he did. In Jesus Christ, we have a great person who did something great. And that is the essence of the gospel. So we won't dilly-dally with Mark on family trees or children's narratives about Jesus. Rather, we come right to this right away. Hear the word of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the ways of the Lord. Make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him and a voice from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts. And the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom and kingly reign of God has come near Repent and believe in the good news. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. There was a man who was talking to his wife. She was on a business trip. And uh, they were doing their phone debriefing at the end of the day. And she said, well, you know, how's the cat? And he said, the cat died. And she was really upset. She, you don't just drop a ton of bricks on me like that. Uh, I mean, that's disconcerting. You, you need to kind of break it to me. Work up to it. Prepare me for it. 
Like, you know, you could have said the cat got on the roof and can't get down. And then the, when I call tomorrow, you could bring another degree to it. And you just don't do it like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? And uh, he said, noted, got it. And she said, okay, how's mother? And he said, she's out on the roof. Uh, <laughs> Preparing someone is really important. And uh, God prepares us. And he does it in a, a general way, in a specific way. The general way is that he interacts with people over hundreds and hundreds of years, gives them thoughts, has it recorded in what we know as the scriptures. And in those interactions, in those thoughts, in those writings, we learn about the origin of life. We, we learn about an enemy we learn about our place in, in collaborating and succumbing to that enemy. Uh, we learn about its oppression. We, we learn that God is always wanting to deliver. The, the whole Exodus story, for example, tells us that. Uh, we learn that this deliverance and, and, and this sin is very costly. The whole sacrificial system that we read about tells us that. We learned that God has spokespersons, but, but they're limited. And God has leaders, and they too are limited. And, and all of this gives rise to a sense of, you know, we need, the world needs someone who will do a radical intervention, who, who will do a, a dramatic reversal, who will do a, a complete and utter victory and subjugation and annihilation of evil in this cosmos. And God plants that desire and that word in the Old Testament and that's a preparation he gives us. He's like an author in a story who gives us the building blocks of character, the tension, and there's going to be a climax and he prepares us as a good author, as a, a good one who gives us information with which to respond and act. Now the specific way he does it, he says that one who's going to be a hero with God-sized dimensions and nature, there's going to be a forerunner. That's going to be your signal for this. And there were forerunners in that day. There are forerunners in this day. If somebody was... Uh, inaugurated as king, a, a herald would come to this town and say that. If a general had won a victory outside of town, a, a forerunner would come and announce that. Uh, if you went to a, a medieval ball, let's say, and a, a lord is coming in, there, there would be a person who announces, Lord and Lady so-and-so is coming. And if you want to stretch it further into our day and age, you, if, if you saw secret servicemen all over the place and red phones appearing, you would know, you would be being prepared that somebody important is coming. And uh, if you were at a WWF contest, you know, world whatever wrestling, <laughs> which I'm sure we're all at recently, uh, the, the, the announcer would come with that big loudspeaker saying, and now we have Genghis Khan with muscles in his ears and he's going to come against... And, and, all of that would be a preparation that gets us on tiptoe waiting for the appearance of this one. And I was thinking about how that works. If God puts into his word that, that there's going to be someone coming that's important and that there's going to be a forerunner, that, that's got to be like, what, what I was thinking was, what if somebody had come to me uh, when I was young and said, a person in green shoes is going to point out who you're going to marry. Do you think I'd be looking for green shoes? Yeah. And, 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 and if there weren't green shoes, and I just kind of, you know, and then one day green shoes appeared, do you think I'd be on tippy toe? And that's exactly what happened in the New Testament. With John the Baptist, he fit the bill. Not because he wore green shoes, but because he was Elijah-like in his appearance and his ministry. Now, he was called John the Baptizer, and John had one message. 
And that message had a word and it had a sign. Same message, the word was repent and the sign was baptism. Clean up your inside and show it by getting washed on the outside. Rethink your plan for living on the inside and show it by a refreshment ritual on the outside. So that's what he came to do and say, and in that, he was the, the blocking back for the Messiah coming, this great hero. Now, I was thinking about this uh, baptism and on the inside and on the outside, and I... Well, Denise and I have children who are of marrying age, speaking of green shoes and who's going to get married, and uh, none of them have any real plans right now. I've got one who's married and the others are fine. We're no pressure on that. But, you know, they are, you know, surveying and scouting and dating and, and they're, they're looking for Mr. Right. And we have said, perhaps like you have said, you know, you need to work at being, not just finding the right person, but being the right person. Isn't that true? Not just finding the right person, but being the right person. I remember when I was dating Denise, uh, she might give me a call and say, hey, I'm going to come over to your house. And I'd go, great, that's great. And then all of a sudden I'd go, oh, I need to sweep the front walk. I need to uh, empty the garbage can with its overflowing. I need to comb my hair. I need to tell the children to behave. You know, we need to, you know. And I could do all of that. I could do all of that and not be the right person. Now, I want you to see something about repentance. First of all, it's not just about the past. You know, you can say there's accumulated garbage and it's overflowing and you want to get rid of it. But it's as much about the future and getting ready for who's coming. So it's dealing with the past, but also it's getting ready for the future. That's, that's what repentance is and what rethinking your life in terms of the past and what coming is about. But, you know, I could do all of those things. I could empty the trash and comb my hair and still not be the right person. So there were a lot of people who wanted to be the right people. And they were coming out. That's the text told us that a lot of people came out from Jerusalem. Even Jews who were supposed to be really godly people were coming out and saying, I get it, I'm, I'm not completely the right person and I, I want to work at being the right person. And they did what John said. And they came and they came, but you know, wanting to be the right person, getting baptized, that doesn't necessarily translate into actually becoming the right person. But now notice, there was one who came out into the wilderness, and something happened with him that John had spoken about. He said, I'm going to baptize you with water, but what really counts, what will do the real change that we all need, is the Holy Spirit. So they all came out, they got baptized, but the real change didn't happen until one came who had the truest of truth and the truest of humility and the truest of sincerity, and he was baptized, and the heavens were torn open, and the Holy Spirit descended. And he became the one who, with the collaboration of the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit, could bring this utter life change to you and me that we couldn't achieve for ourselves. The Chronicles of Narnia have a great uh, story where there's this selfish boy called Eustace, and Eustace in his selfishness through a different kind of magic becomes a dragon, and he's woeful and uh, forlorn as a dragon. He wants to relate to his friends again just as a human being, but he just can't get there. And he meets the Christ figure, uh, Aslan, a lion, and Aslan says, you've got to change. Uh, and uh, he thought, well, I'm a reptile. I can change. I'll just shed some skin. So he shed some skin, sees it lying there, and then he looks in the pond and sees himself a dragon still. So he tears off another layer. Same thing again. He tears off another layer. Same thing again. See, there's water. You can do this again and again and again, but you still end up as a dragon until Aslan, the Christ figure, takes his talon and tears asunder his breast and rips the dragon 
part of him completely off. And this is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes to us. The heavens tear apart and he takes us to a whole new place of who we can be. Now, not only does the Holy Spirit come down, but a voice comes down. And that voice says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Now notice in the very first verse, Mark has said the same thing. This is the son of God. And Isaiah has said it. And John the Baptist has said it. And now heaven itself says Jesus is the son of God. So he, his dimensions are windmill-like in size. In my own testimony, I remember thinking there are people who are telling me with utter seriousness and historical validity that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And I thought, doesn't that need to stop you in your tracks and give you some pause and render some analysis? I mean, how do you go, oh, okay, Son of God. Hey, could I have another piece of pizza? Or uh, let's talk about the Super Bowl halftime show. I mean, that's just stepping over this magnificent and monumental claim. And so I wonder if you have thought about Jesus as the Son of God. Those kind of dimensions. Mark will tell you to go in that direction completely. You're not going to meet the Master until you meet him as the Son of God. This son of God, as I said, has windmill-like dimensions. And Mark's going to go a little bit further, mysteriously and profoundly further, because he's going to tell us that it has the, the dimensions of the creation of the world, that it's Genesis level, what we're talking about as Jesus comes on the scene. And he does it just like John, the evangelist, does it. John starts out and says, in the beginning was the word. And that in the beginning is the same phrase that the whole Bible starts with, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. And that word beginning is also in the first sentence of Mark. And then just like in that creation story, we have what? God speaking. God speaks. Something happens. We have water. And we have the spirit in Genesis 1 hovering like a dove over the water. And we have all of those same elements here. And when you put it all together and hold on to it loosely, it says that something monumental, something that is shaking the foundations of reality and reshaping them, shaping and reshaping the very nature of the cosmos is happening in Jesus Christ. Now, you may not get it, you may not understand it, but as Mark brings us the Master, he wants us to understand that there is something that huge in Jesus Christ. Will you be open to meeting the one who reshaped the face of creation in his presence and in his work? You know, there's, there's something else that's from the Genesis story that appears in the verses we read. And that's a temptation. And Satan appears. And we know from that first story that when Satan comes on the scene, something disastrous happened for Adam. Now Satan on the scene with Jesus should tip our hands to Jesus being pretty significant. Satan it only appears in person to one other person in the whole Bible, and that's Adam. And so something really big is happening here when Satan appears. And Adam's downfall had disastrous consequences for us. We know that. We've lived with it, and all of our history has been part of it. David and Goliath, remember how that story goes? There's a winner take all. One man goes out, another man goes out. And just imagine if Goliath had slayed David, and then he would have plundered and killed and oppressed and enslaved all the Israelites. And in just the same way, in this revisiting, this sequel, this rematch 
that happens in Mark 1. And Paul helps us when he calls Jesus the second Adam. We wonder what is going to happen. See, if Jesus, if Jesus fails in this temptation in Mark chapter 1, we don't have to bother going to Mark chapter 16 because he has failed the test. He is no longer the perfect man and the perfect sacrifice for us. So this is critical what's happening here in this first chapter. And Jesus, we find out, with bated breath, we look, and he not only did the baptism perfectly right, but he does the temptation right, such that the angels come and minister to him. And we've heard about substitutionary sacrifice, that life for me. Well, here we have a substitutionary baptism. He did it perfectly for you and me. We have a substitutionary temptation. You and I have failed in the test, but he did it perfectly. You see, the, the story about David and Goliath is not that we should go out and be a David for God. The truth is that God was a David for us. He's already slain the Goliath, and here he conquers in the temptation. He came, entered the world, did this monumental thing in his life and accomplishment, and it started with his baptism, it progressed to his temptation. And the old bad news is that Adam failed. And the great, fresh, good news that changes everything is that Jesus Christ succeeded. And not just that he succeeded, but that he succeeded for you and for me. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We can try to rely on our own success, our own earnestness in a, a baptism and making plans and repenting. Uh, we can rely on our own track record for enduring temptation, but we already know we failed. But you come to us and you've not only given us your name to pray with, not only given us your life from the cross, but you have given us your success. Your success is the one who endured temptation and came through the other side victorious. And we celebrate that everything that failed in the first Adam, you have repaired in your life and your accomplishments. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we come to the table. This table is for anyone who would like to meet Jesus. You don't have to be a member of the church. You don't have to be a Presbyterian. You're welcome at this table. The words of institution. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. O oh God. You are the Lord of this table, and you're the one who commanded us to meet you here. Do minister to us through this bread and cup. Minister to us the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, all of his success. Minister to us his love, his grace, his wisdom, his humility, and his power. Unite us to him and to one another, for we pray in Jesus' name and with the words he taught us when he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.